MC Lobshier, the host of the Cash Linenja podcast, and also the president and chief wealth and investment strategist of Producers Wealth, where we help our clients integrate cash flow banking, also known as infinite banking, with their business and investments. If you're interested in learning more about how we create strategies that integrate cash flow banking and investments to turbocharge them, you can access a video series at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Here is your host inside the dojo, MC Laubscher. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobs here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today. And in today's show, we're going to look at the five elements of raising money. I'm joined today by Victor Minash. Victor is a serial entrepreneur who got his start in business designing microprocessors. Along the way, he conducted business in over 15 countries, participated in several mergers and acquisitions, and developed executive leadership skills. Victor noticed that there was a formula for raising money. When the rules were met, it was easy. When elements were missing, it was difficult. Victor shares the five elements of raising capital as he revealed also in his book, Magnetic Capital. MC Lobshire, the creator and host of the Cashflow Ninja and president of Producers Wealth. And I'm on a mission to help you achieve economic and financial freedom as quickly as possible. I achieve this by integrating the infinite banking concept with real estate investments to increase your efficiency and returns and recapture cash flow that you're not even aware of that you're losing. I share the number one strategy for investors in my holistic wealth creation course at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. Victor, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Can you please share a little bit about your background and journey with my listeners? You know, my path into real estate investing was definitely not the traditional career path. Uh, I started out my career as an electrical engineer. I started out as a microprocessor designer and uh, was building processors in the telecom industry. Uh, I was responsible for the hardware development in the carrier network division at uh, Nortel Networks. Uh, sad that that company's gone. And I just did a lot of processor development. You know, if you've flown on any Airbus aircraft, those seat back displays uh, that, play, that you play movies on, uh, my microprocessors in most of those, uh, Cisco uh, routers, Cisco wireless access points, uh, Panasonic printers, just you know, dozens and dozens of applications all over the world. So that was that's where I got my start in uh, in business. Uh, but along the way, in the tech world, uh, was involved in a number of startup companies, a bunch of corporate acquisitions, and learned how to raise money. Uh, so that's really where I got my start in raising capital. And then it was around 2009, 2010. I was traveling back and forth to Japan every two weeks. We were building a new cellular network in Japan and it was just burning me out. I think it was like my 18th or 20th trip to Tokyo and decided it was time to do something completely different. So I took a hard left turn in my career and moved full-time into the world of real estate investing. In retrospect, a little riskier than move, a little riskier move than I probably should have taken at that time, but that was that's how I got here. Tell me a little bit more about that time too, because th this was basically a little bit on the edge, I believe, of that d d uh, huge downturn and, and lost recession. So what, what were some of the things that, that you uh, saw as opportunities? Because there sure was a lot of them. And what were some of the things that you saw as challenges when you got started? I think the biggest challenge, number one, was that things took much longer in the real world than I expected them to. And so timeframes expanded, you know, what I thought I could accomplish in six months would take a year and so on. But in fact, where I got my start, I never really took a pure real estate approach to things. I started in real estate in, in Ottawa, where I live. I live in Ottawa, Canada, our, our nation's capital. And it has a micro market where we have parliamentary staff, embassy staff, military officers, government contractors who come through the city on medium term assignments. 
anywhere from three to six months. And generally, the government spends money in six-month increments. So a 12-month unfurnished lease is of no use to those people. A sweet hotel at you know 3500 a month is of no use to them. And so there was this gap in the marketplace. I figured out what their housing allowance was and decided to go service that market. I said, okay, I know what the housing allowance is. I'm going to provide a product at that price point. What can I deliver as an executive fully furnished rental uh, that will give me, you know, 25, 30% better uh, revenue and margin than your traditional unfurnished lease. And so that's where I started in building that portfolio. So it was a good business. But it wasn't a great business. It was just a good business. And then, like you said, 2008, 2009 rolled around. And I saw that as the opportunity of a lifetime to jump in and acquire assets far below replacement cost and uh, build a portfolio from that. You know, just, you know, leveraging the Warren Buffett, you know, buy when people are scared and, you know, sell when people are exuberant. Right, right. And now, You've you've doing a lot of development since that. When did you kind of transition into developing real estate and share a little bit uh, uh, more about some of the projects that you're involved with? Sure. We started developing, uh, you know, I developed some partnerships with some folks in Philadelphia back in 2010, 2011, and they were doing some good work. I had some background in raising money. And, uh, uh, you know, we were introduced by a mutual friend who said, you know, we've got some couple of good guys that are uh, doing good work, but they're short of cash. So I flew down to Philadelphia and met with them and was impressed with what they were doing and basically said, all right, you know, if you had more capital, you could do more. Uh, we'd have to share the profits, but then you'd more than make it up on volume. And that sounded good to them. So we went out and bought a whole bunch of properties together. Uh, in an auction. We bought 15 properties in one day from an auction and uh, that's how we got our start in the business. Many of those buildings were derelict structures and what we started doing is keeping the exterior shell of those buildings. They're very, you know, historic buildings, 100-year-old buildings and demolish the inside and put a new building on the inside with a historic facade. And so that kind of felt like new construction. It wasn't quite new construction, but it was pretty close. Um, And we did a fair bit of that. So the jump from there to new construction was actually a very small step. And, uh, you know, at that time, of course, you could buy things for far below construction cost. It didn't make sense to build uh, because the economics didn't work. But as time progressed and the market prices came up in the market, um, you could now get to a point where you could build for equal to um, what things were selling for in the market, or in many cases, less. And uh, so that that transition happened pretty quickly. So by 2013, 2014, probably 90% of what we were doing was new construction, mostly infill in Philadelphia market. And what we were doing is we were buying single family lots and per- putting together small land assemblies. So if we could get you know, three or four lots together, that might be a nine unit building. If, it, you know, we got five lots together, that could be a 13 unit building. It just depended on what the density permitted based on the land that we were able to assemble. And uh, so we just did a fair, fair bit of that. And uh, that, that's really how we got started into developing. Victor, you talk a lot about market selection. I figured this would be a great opportunity to talk about how uh, you select certain markets. What were some of the uh, things that um, had you pinned down Philadelphia specifically in that market and that uh, looked very attractive for you? You know, oftentimes people, you know, if you listen to the news, you know, read the Wall Street Journal, they talk about national statistics. Um, you go, you get, go to any of the major news sources, they talk about national statistics, maybe regional statistics. And in my view, they're completely irrelevant. Uh, they're meaningless. You know, if, uh, if Bill Gates walks in a restaurant, the average net worth in the room went up, but nobody went home any richer at the end of the night. So, it, it, you know, the statistics are meaningless. It, it's really the, the local mo- micro situations that, that matter. So we found an area in Philadelphia, uh, just to the west of Temple University, where the university was expanding. The, at the time, there was a shortage of student housing. There were lots of derelict structures uh, within a few blocks walking distance of the campus. And we saw that as an opportunity to provide student housing. So we saw... Uh, really a line between a, a, a very desirable area and, and a really awful area uh, that were really separated by one block. And we saw that 
that uh, diversity, that economic diversity as an opportunity. So that line could move. And we saw it moving at the rate of about a, a one block a year. And that really gave the genesis to a strategy that I call buy, buy on the line, move the line. And, you know, that line exists in most cities in America where you've got a hot gentrified neighborhood with a coffee shop on every corner and people walk to the art gallery and you go two blocks too far and you're in the hood. And I, I'm, I'm sure your listeners are imagining that in their, in their own home city right now because every city in America has that situation. So if you can buy just on the wrong side of that line, not too deep, but just right on that line and you redevelop that line, now the line's on the other side of your property. Now, if you just do one or two, nobody cares, nobody notices. But if you put a little scale behind it, maybe you do five, 10, or 20, the marketplace says, oh, I get it. The line has moved. And so you're able to buy for pennies on the dollar, deeply discounted because you're buying on the wrong side of the line. And when you have a completed product, the only place you can get a comparable valuation is from the good side because there is no brand new product in the hood. So you're able to get 97, 98% of the valuation of the hot neighborhood and you're able to buy at the prices of buying in the hood. A very simple value creation strategy. Yeah, no, and very, very powerful. One of the things that you've done so well, Victor, and, and a secret to your success is Rising Capital, author of Magnetic Capital, uh, the book where you share a lot of these strategies. Um, uh, can you share the elements of Rising Capital and these five elements that you share in the book as well with my listeners? Yeah, happy to. You know, when I, and the reason I wrote the book, um, I, I got my start in raising capital in the tech industry. Uh, and and I learned how to do that. You know, we did five different corporate acquisitions, uh, raised a lot of money uh, from a variety of different sources, whether it was venture capital or private equity, uh, and, and just became very adept at that. Moved into the world of real estate investing and kind of had to relearn it all over again. You know, I started with my own money. Right, I ran out just like everybody else does and then had to realize that, you know, okay, Victor, you, you know how to raise capital. So you tap into that. And I relearned the process, discovered it was almost exactly the same. And uh, my business coach at the time said, Victor, you need to write this book. Uh, so I, I did. I went home that night and outlined 13 chapters and said, yeah, he's kind of right. So uh, that was the genesis of the book. And I really saw a gap in the marketplace where many of the books on the topic were kind of academic, um, and would, I really wanted to write something that was much more practical, much more accessible from the perspective of a practitioner who's been doing it. And what I discovered along the way is that there are five principles. And if you adhere to these five principles, raising money is remarkably easy. And if one or more of those are missing, it gets hard. It gets really, really hard very quickly. And so, uh, briefly, the five are, and I'll, I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll go into them in a little bit more detail. But number one, relationship. Most people are not going to part with, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of their life savings if, for, with folks that they don't have a relationship with. Number two is trust. Number three is results. What's your track record? Number four is you've got to have a compelling opportunity. And that's where most people lead. They say, you know, I've got a deal, got a deal, got a deal, got a deal. And it's never about the deal. And then finally, the last one, this one's very important, is what I call alignment. And this is making sure that you have perfect alignment between the goals for the money and the goals for the project. Because money always has an agenda associated with it. We don't think of it that way, but it always does. So those are the five. So let's, let's go back over them in a little bit more detail. I see so many people out there trying to raise money and they're building a list and they're putting it in a, you know, CRM tool, a customer relationship management tool, or maybe a, an email autoresponder. And they're trying to apply internet marketing techniques to getting people to part with their life savings. And it doesn't work. Um, you know, nobody wants to be used. Nobody wants to be sold. It starts at the very core with the foundation of relationship. In fact, in most jurisdictions, it's illegal to solicit for, for investment. And so the government's actually doing you a favor by making it illegal because you know what? It doesn't work anyway. So start with relationship. And, by, and I'm, I don't mean networking. I'm talking about real, genuine relationship where the relationship's the most important. And if you have a, a meaningful relationship, you, you would be disloyal to that relationship if you didn't offer them 
the opportunity to get into something really good. So I never, ever ask for money. Uh, and I'm genuine when I say that. I really am never asking for money. But what I do is I offer people with whom I have a strong relationship the opportunity to collaborate with me on a project. And that's a completely different posture. And if it's not a fit for them at that moment, that's fine. The relationship's more important. Uh, never desperate for money. We always want to find the right fit, and it starts with relationships. So, so that's the key. So that's, that's number one relationship. Number two is trust. And number two is not just am I dealing with an honest person. Uh, that's very primitive. The, the psychological contract of trust has a lot of layers to it. Uh, and you can think of questions like, can I trust you to put together a good plan? Can I trust you to execute the plan? Can I trust you to hire the right people? Can I trust you with my money? Can I trust you to open or to communicate in an open and transparent way? Can I trust you to communicate when there's a problem? And on and on and on and on. And if any one of those are missing, you know, can I trust you with small commitments? If anything's missing, it kind of doesn't work. So you've got to be really mindful of that genuine, deeper psychological contract of trust and honor it and recognize that trust gets built over time and it can be destroyed in a nanosecond. And just be very, like I said, mindful of managing that aspect of the relationship because it's so vitally important. And you'll know when the trust is there because decisions happen quickly. If the trust isn't there, that's when you know your funding partner will say, eh, I don't know, we probably need to spend another two or three weeks doing due diligence. There's a clue, the trust isn't there quite fully. So, so that's number two. Number three is results. What's your track record? Show me that you know how to make money. Uh, show, the, show me you know how to do it consistently. Now, you might, your, your listeners might be thinking, well, how am I going to raise money if I don't have a track record? How am I going to get a track record if I can't raise any money? I'm stuck. And if, I mean, if you stay trapped in that paradigm, you'd be right. But remember, business is a team sport. It's not like your grade three math test where if you work with your neighbor, you're cheating. Uh, this is a team sport. So if you don't have the track record, work with someone who does. Hire your boss. Go work for somebody for a period of time, maybe six months, maybe a year, so you can le legitimately borrow from their credibility because you've earned it. You know, you can say, my partners and I have built 3,000 apartments. Okay, you've built two and he's built 3,000. It's still a valid statement. Um, so, you know, go work with somebody and so you can get some of that track record. You can borrow some of that track record. Um, so that's number three. Uh, and number four is where most people lead. You know, I've got a deal. And, you know, this is kind of like asking, is the image on the magazine cover beautiful? That's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. For one person, it might be uh, a self-storage facility at a 10% cap rate. For somebody else, it might be mobile homes or mobile home park. For someone else, it might be medical office buildings uh, with certain financial metrics. Uh, so you really have to figure out what that is. What is that definition of beauty? What's compelling for somebody? For me, uh, one of the critical items is I want projects that have really, really strong margins. I don't like projects with thin margins. And I see People, especially in today's marketplace, paying way too much money, doing projects with thin margins, and they say, you know, oh yeah, but I'll make one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, but you're at, you know, you're a ten percent margin. You know, if you have one mistake, you could be at break even. You have two mistakes, you're underwater. It's too thin. It, you know, you've got to have fat margins in all your projects. I always look for projects that will generate twenty five, thirty percent margin for at, you know, at the outset. And yeah, the real world can kick in and erode that 30% margin to 20 or 18 or 25 or some other number, but at least you've got some margin, you've got some safety. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, for safety, but number two, I want an exit strategy. If you have something that's underwater, you've got a prison for your money and for your investor's money. And I don't want that. So I want, I want the flexibility of having multiple exit strategies. And chief among them, especially in multifamily, is I want to be able to refinance the project once it's leased up and stabilized and return 100% of the invested capital to the investors within a very short time period, maybe a year, maybe two years. If it's a large project, it might be longer. But I want that as an exit strategy. And to me, at that point, you get to, you get to a point where you have this um, – 
asymmetric risk where you've got no risk on the downside because the investors have all their capital back and they own and you've got lots of upside so that's asymmetric risk and you always want to get in that position so that's that's kind of foundational and to me that's the definition of a compelling opportunity and then the last one is alignment and this is finding that perfect fit you know the analogy i like to use is if you go to the shoe store and you see that beautiful pair of shoes and my gosh it's your lucky day they're on sale if they don't fit you're not a buyer it doesn't matter how beautiful they are it doesn't matter how deeply discounted they are if they don't fit you're not a buyer and yet when we talk about investment capital we get all weird about it but when we talk about shoes everyone gets it and you got to think of it just like the pair of shoes so Oftentimes, just because money is there sitting in a bank account doesn't mean it's there for you. It means that it's got to fit just like the pair of shoes. And so what are the parameters that define the fit? It's things like what's the size of the investment? What's the term of the investment? Meaning how long is the money going to be tied up for? What's the rate of return? What's the risk? What's the security? What's the control structure? What's the tax consequence? Uh, and so on. So, and you've got to get a perfect fit on those. You know, you know, you may have an unsophisticated investor who says, "Well, my goal is to make money," and those folks are out there. But if you're dealing with more sophisticated investors, they're very clear on what their investment criteria are. And if you don't have a perfect match, it's not going to work. It'd be seductive because it'll seem like it almost works, but if it almost works, it actually doesn't. So you don't want to waste your time or theirs trying to force something that's not going to fit. And I never want to uh, have an investment feel like it was forced in any way. Uh, If you do, you open yourself up to tons of liability. Uh, So I never try and convince anybody of anything. I'm happy to educate them and, you know, share with them why we're doing what we're doing, but it really has to be a frictionless kind of transaction. If there's anything about it forced, it doesn't work. So those are the five principles. And if you adhere to all of those, raising money is remarkably, remarkably easy. You're listening to Victor Minash on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Life settlement investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic market and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. And if you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments for number of solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. You're listening to Victor Minash on the Cashflow Ninja podcast, and now back to our interview. Thank you so much for sharing that, and uh, so, so powerful, all of those principles, and especially the last one, too, because I think it really uh, will resonate with a lot of people right now, maybe listening to it, because there are <laughs> uh, quite a number of folks doing things that maybe they shouldn't be doing because it is a little bit frothy, um, which ties into the next um uh, kind of segment, which I'm pretty excited to speak to you about. about well, I, actually, I want to I want to jump in and add one sure. more because this is something that uh, I really maybe it's hammering at home. But you know, relationship is so. It, this is these are human relationships at the very foundation. Yep. And and you want to think about the progression of a human relationship as following a very natural path. And the best example of that is a romantic relationship. So, you know, you, two people might get together, they may go for coffee, they may go see a show, uh, they may uh, hang out together, do a bunch of activities that they have like to do in common. A long way down the road, they may get engaged, get married, start a family. That follows a very natural progression. Now, if you skip any steps along that process, you go from a very natural relationship progression to creepy in a heartbeat. <laughs> Yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I know all the women in the audience are relating to this instantly. <laughs> right? Yep, absolutely. And how often in business do people go to creepy? All the time. You know, yep. you'll get, a, you'll get a, a friend request on LinkedIn and all of a sudden, boom, right there, they're soliciting you for business. Who, who the hell are you? You know, so it, it, don't go to creepy. 
follow the natural relationship progression and don't go to creepy. Anyway, so yes. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Very, very well said. That's, that's so, so true. Um, touching on where we are right now, we've, we've, we've m- mentioned 2008, 2009, and I believe it was um, uh, maybe a day or so ago, the 10-year anniversary of Lehman Brothers uh, yes. collapsing. Um, where do you think we are right now as far as the market cycle economically? And what do you see uh, as far as real estate where we are at? Is, uh, is the next real estate downturn uh, around the corner or is it here already? 2008 was not a real estate downturn. 2008 was a capital crisis um, spawned by a bunch of derivatives that were you know, badly, uh, badly managed by Wall Street. And when that happened, the banks lost the ability to lend because their balance sheets were upside down. So we went from a situation where there was a lot of demand, and then as soon as the availability of money evaporated, you had a market situation where there were a, you know, a number of sellers, and the only buyers were cash buyers. And so that, that inverted the supply-demand situation such that you know, the prices fell dramatically because there were so few buyers and the only ones were cash buyers. So it was really a credit crisis, not a real estate crisis. And the proof of that is that when liquidity got put back into the market, prices basically came back to where they were before and beyond where they were before. Today, the availability of cheap money has fueled prices to uh, what I consider to be stupid levels on in many, many markets. There's a lot of money chasing too few opportunities and the proof of that is, you know, if there's a, uh, you know, a 200 unit complex that comes on the market, brokers are rarely doing off market deals. They're running them as auctions because they know they'll get 20 offers. And, you know, they, they're maximizing the value for their client, which is exactly what they should do. Uh, but in that kind of a situation, I never want to be the winning bidder if there's 19 guys behind me. I'm guaranteed to be paying too much. So, you know, that's definitely one of the market conditions is way too much money chasing too few opportunities. Uh, the cap rates are ridiculous. Uh, uh, you know, I saw a property come on the market in Plano, Texas, which is a de- uh, suburb of North Dallas. And there's a lot of influx of jobs and populations and new corporate headquarters and all kinds of stuff. It's a very, very active market. And I saw a C-class complex come on the market at a 5% cap rate. I'm thinking, this is nuts. This is craziness. And they'll get it. I have no doubt they'll get it in that location. So, uh, you know, real estate is hyper local. Uh, there are going to be local market conditions where the prices are in the stratosphere where they don't make any sense. And my counsel to anyone I talk to as an investor is don't lower your standards. Uh, just because other people are doing it, don't lower your standards. If that means staying on the sidelines in that particular location, fine. Or what I prefer to do is, you know, I don't want to compete with people. I don't like auction environments, but if I can build an equivalent product in that location for a third less than it's selling for on the open market, now that starts to get interesting. So I don't chase deals. I'd rather make them. I'd rather manufacture them out of thin air because then I have, number one, I have control. And number two, I can have control over the value. So that, that's kind of my perspective. Yeah, and, and you make a lot of great points there. Um, and for folks to, to capitalize on uh, with where we are at in the market cycle and then also a lot of the different trends. I mean, we have so many trends uh, right now. Uh, the baby boomer being a very, very big one yes. as far as home ownership, as far as businesses that uh, will have to uh, be transferred over and so forth. Um, what are some of the things that you're, you're, well, that you would counsel or advise for folks to do to position themselves and how to capital, capitalize on some of these opportunities and trends that, that you've identified? There's so many interesting demographic trends, uh, and you absolutely need to pay attention to them. How to, how to respond to them is always the, the interesting question, is always the problem. But um, so the, bo- the baby boomers are absolutely um, starting to retire. There's been a tremendous amount of growth in senior living and in assisted living in anticipation of that. Today, um, assisted living nationwide is actually overbuilt because you know what? People enter assisted living at 85 years of age and the baby boomers are not 85 yet. So that segment, at least in many of the primary markets, is overbuilt. Now, secondary tertiary markets, 
it's underserviced. So it, it, it really depends. You've got to look at the local market conditions. But what we're finding is that some, you know, if you read a lot of the industry newsletters, you'll find that people bringing new product into the market in that segment are experiencing very low occupancy because there's just way more supply than demand. Uh, people are not, at, you know, the, the, the numbers at 85 years of age just aren't there yet. Now it'll catch up but they're not there yet. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in business uh, with the baby boomers. About 75% of the small businesses that are owned by baby boomers have no exit strategy uh, for folks that are, you know, less than five years away from retirement. That's crazy to me. You know, one in 13 small business will shut down and not actually sell. That's a it's it's a it's a terrible terrible ratio. So it's an amazing opportunity. It's the opportunity of the century, really, for any millennials who want to get into business because often you can acquire those businesses for zero money down. You can buy them with their own money because the alternative is they're going to shut it down. Any market where you have thirteen sellers for every one buyer gives you tremendous negotiating leverage. Um, and so there's lots and lots and lots of opportunity in that space. And even in real estate, we simultaneously have a surplus and a shortage of housing. The surplus is at the top of the market where baby boomers are getting rid of the homestead, you know, the five or six bedroom McMansion. Uh, but the millennials that are looking to acquire a starter home can't afford that. So we're seeing compression. So prices are falling at the top of the market and prices are rising like crazy at the bottom of the market. You're seeing starter homes, townhouses, uh, going up in price because there just isn't um, the supply at that end of the market. And at the top end of the market, the dollars per square foot is falling. So we're starting to see compression there as well. Very, very fascinating time to be in real estate. Yeah. And, and what you just mentioned, I'm, I've seen something similar to that and in, in just in the area that I live in. So it's, uh, it's absolutely a very, very interesting time. Um, Victor, now one habit I've observed from very wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. What are you currently studying and what new skill sets are you currently learning? Well, I started, I'm constantly learning. Uh, I, I believe there's, it's important to set goals in a couple of different ways. There's, of course, uh, attainment goals. You know, maybe you have a goal to add another hundred doors to your portfolio by a certain date. That's an attainment goal. Uh, the second form of goal setting is um, habituation or habit forming type goals. And that's where I put most of my focus and attention. Uh, so, you know, I'm always um, investing in daily learning. Um, earlier this year, I started a podcast, the Real Estate Espresso podcast, which is a daily show seven days a week. And I'm getting better and better and better as a podcaster. So that, that's been an area of significant investment for me in learning all the different aspects of that. If I compare the quality of the shows that I'm putting out today with you know, the sh shows that I put out in the very first week, there's a dramatic difference in, in quality. Uh, so I feel good about that. And so I'm constantly investing uh, in you know, just my own personal growth in m multiple different facets. No, absolutely, and really enjoy your show as well. I would uh, advise listeners to check it out. Uh, fantastic content that you continue to put out in your show and also uh, on all of your other platforms. Now, Victor, of course, a message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. Mm -hmm. so if you cannot put, uh, pass on any money to future generations, and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? What I've found is that in order to accomplish anything well in life, you need three things. Number one, you need the knowledge. So, you know, a lot of people go out, they take a course, they go to a seminar, they say, okay, great, I've got the knowledge, I'm all set. And the fact is, you're only a third of the way there. That's textbook knowledge. It's not real knowledge. The only kind of knowledge that really works is based on practice, on pra being a practitioner. But even if you have that, it's still not enough. So you, obviously you need the knowledge. Number two, the second is you need the emotional drive to make that happen. And connected with that, you need to eliminate the emotional obstacles that are getting in the way. So that means developing the self-awareness to figure out what those emotional obstacles are. And you can rarely figure those out on your own because they're usually in your blind spot. 
So this is where you need someone or maybe an entire group of folks around you helping you figure out what those blind spots are. You know, I, I'm fond of telling people, uh, you know, sometimes people are very ashamed of things that they're not good at, so they don't like to look there. But the way that I think about it is, you know, if you're about to go to an important meeting and you're all dressed up, you're wearing a suit, uh, but the zipper's down on your trousers, you'd like someone to tell you early in the day. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's, it's a blind spot, right? Right. Uh, and, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. You just want to know and you want it solved right away. So, you know, blind spots are like that. You can't see them and yet they're, they're awkward and they're, they're embarrassing. But if you know them, you can fix them. So that's number two. And then number three, and this is the most important, uh, you've got to be in the right environment. And that's what people most often neglect. You know, they they might be sitting at home looking to Google for answers. It's not where you're going to be successful. If you want to do development, go hang out with other developers. If you want to be an Olympic athlete, go hang out with other Olympic athletes. Is It's no surprise that all the Olympic gold medalists, they all train together even though they're competing against each other. You know, the, the where all the figure skaters go, they go to the same rinks in Barrie, Ontario, and in Montreal even if they're from other countries, they all train together. It's amazing. So you got to be in the right environment. Um, and, and that's, that's key. So if you're not in the right environment, we'll go create it somehow. Yeah, no. And those are very, very powerful, Victor. Thank you for, for sharing that. I just had a chuckle when you mentioned <laughs> about the zipper, the fly and actually full disclosure that happened to me about 10 to 12 years ago. I think I was doing a presentation for about 30 people and uh, th that's kind of how it started. And, but someone uh, recognized my blind spot, called me over and said, MC, <laughs> you might want to go fix that buddy before you uh get get into your presentation so, right, right yeah so i thoroughly enjoyed that thank you for sharing those victor how can my listeners learn more about you um all of the projects that you're involved uh, with how can they follow you and uh, uh, also how can they learn more and listen to your podcast uh, so my website is victorjm.com. Uh, we have all kinds of neat stuff going on there. I uh, have mastermind with my mentor, who's an extraordinary man. Uh, so f uh, reach out and connect with me at victorjm.com. The podcast is the Real Estate Espresso Podcast. It's your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing seven days a week. It's a five-minute short-form podcast every day. Uh, and it, on the weekdays, it's just me reporting on what's new in the world of investing it's educational content. The weekend is slightly longer interview style, interviewing notable people from the world of real estate investing. So love to have you as a listener. And uh, the show is doing great. It's, uh, listenership is growing every day and uh, getting just tons of awesome feedback from the listeners and tons of great engagement. So I love that as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. My pleasure. Great to connect with you. Yeah, likewise. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the United States. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Learn how to find the best deals by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Thank you for joining me again on the Cashflow Ninja. Thank you for all your support. You rock. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can sign up for our newsletter at cashflowninja.com or text Cashflow Ninja to 44. Two, two, two. I'm also posting daily videos on Facebook and YouTube and will live stream weekly starting May 2018. To make sure you don't miss any of the live streams, please like and subscribe to my Facebook and YouTube platforms. I'm also dropping content on Instagram daily. Be sure to follow us on Instagram to get in on the action. I want to thank you for spending your most precious resource with me today, your time. That's our show for today. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms.
This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.